to the degree that a tightly knit or cohesive group is necessary for optimal performance is dependent upon the skill sets that the coach is able to lead the team or individuals through. But like this chapter is indicating, we are focusing on group and team dynamics, and we will address ways to develop cohesion within teams. We'll also learn different styles of leadership and essential good communication skills and effective ways to deal with confrontation. We'll begin by helping to define groups and teams and understanding the differences between the two. Most researchers study the potential positive aspects of group formation and subsequent performance or productivity, and so there can be some negative aspects to being part of a group as well. These would be defined as social loafing, self-deception, conformity, group thinking, and de-individualization. Some might think that it's easy to define a group or a team, but it can actually be more complex than just trying to strictly define one or the other. In the sports psychology setting, we define a group as two or more people who interact with and exert mutual influence upon each other. A sense of mutual interaction or interdependence for a common purpose distinguishes a group from a mere collection of individuals. A collection of individuals is not necessarily a group, and a group is not necessarily a team. Both groups and team members may like or be attracted to other members within the group or team. Members of a group typically will have a common goal. And within groups or teams, we also see that they share some common characteristics as well. A sports team is really a special type of group. Teams have four key characteristics. Number one, that they have a collective sense of identity. Number two, they all have distinctive roles that they fulfill within the group or team setting. Thirdly, there are structured modes of communication that are seen within the hierarchical structure of a group or team. And then lastly, we must understand and consider the norms or the social rules that guide members within the team and tell them what to do and what not to do. Now let's look at some theories that help identify group development. By definition, a team is any group of people who must interact with each other to accomplish shared objectives or goals as we indicated before. This is somewhat of an evolutionary process and is constantly developing and it will respond to both internal and external factors. We have to therefore understand how a group becomes a team. To study team development, theories fall into three different categories. Groups develop in stages or in what is known as a linear fashion. This is called the linear theory. Groups then follow what we call a cyclical pattern or the cyclical theory. Groups also develop what is known as a pendulum-like manner among them, which is the pendulum theory. The linear perspective is based on the assumption that groups move progressively through different stages, and issues may arise in different stages along the way. When successfully dealt with, the group can move on. Most groups go through all four stages of development, and the duration of each stage and the sequence that follows varies from one group to another in the process. In the first stage, we call this forming. This is when members of a team engage in social comparison and assess one another's strengths and weaknesses. The second stage is called storming, which is characterized by resistance to the leader or resistance to control by the group, and sometimes we see interpersonal conflict within this stage. The third stage is called norming, where hostility is replaced by solidarity and cooperation. And this sort of unity is really effective for helping unite the team. And in the final stage, performing, we see further uniting of team members as they learn to work together to channel their energies for team success, so the focus becomes more group-oriented. In the cyclical or life cycle perspective, we see that the life cycle models have in common the assumption that groups and sports develop in a manner similar to the life cycle of the individual experiencing birth, growth, and eventually death as the season closes. The final or third model is the pendular perspective. We see that earlier linear and life cycle models were based on the underlying assumptions that groups possess an inherent static development that is unresponsive to the demands of the environment. The pendular model examines the shifts that occur in interpersonal relationships during the growth and development of groups. Every group develops its own structure and these signs begin to emerge as early on as the group's first meeting. During these times, group norms and group roles are defined. Let's look at group roles, which are defined as a set of behaviors required and expected of the person occupying a position within a group. 
Coaches, as an example, are expected to perform such behaviors as teaching, instructing, and organizing practices and interacting with officials or even parents. We also must understand formal and informal roles. A team plays formal and informal roles within its group. Formal roles are dictated by the nature and structure of the organization. Informal roles evolve from interactions among group members. This helps us to understand role clarity within a team as well. A coach can improve a team's effectiveness by making sure that players understand and accept their roles. Role clarity mediates the relationship between role ambiguity and athlete satisfaction. Unclear roles tend to hurt a team's performance. Within the group or team setting, role acceptance is also very important to enhance a group structure, and coaches can help accept roles among players by minimizing the status differences among roles and emphasizing that the success of the team depends on each individual's contribution in terms of what role they play. Therefore, role acceptance depends on four conditions. First, the opportunity to use specialized skills. Secondly, feedback and role recognition. Third, role significance. And finally, autonomy, or the ability to work individually and effectively within the group. Role conflict is seen to exist when the role occupant doesn't have sufficient ability, motivation, time, or understanding to achieve a particular goal. Group norms are also established within teams. A norm is a level of performance, a pattern of behavior, or a belief seen within a group or a team. These can be either formally established or informally developed by the group themselves. A norm might involve practicing behaviors, even dress and hairstyle, and the interaction between rookies and veterans. Therefore, norms should be positive. It's imperative for a coach to establish positive norms and standards within his team. One good method to create positive norms is to enlist the formal and informal leaders of a team to set positive examples. So whenever possible, try to include all team members in decision making about norms adopted by the team overall. We also need to modify team norms from time to time. When team norms need to be changed, there are two things to consider. The source of the communication to change the norms and the nature of that communication as it's presented to the players. The process of changing group norms is more effective when people on both sides of the argument are present and there are multiple communications among the players and conclusions are stated explicitly. Team climates develop from how players perceive interrelationship among the group players or those on the team, and players' perceptions and evaluations set the team's climate. Within these ideal climates, we must consider the following components. First off, social support, which is an exchange of resources between at least two individuals perceived by the provider or the recipient to be intended to enhance the well-being of the recipient. We also need to understand proximity, whereby we come to realize that people are more likely to bond when they are actually near each other and there's close contact with teammates, whereby we can promote interaction among them, which in turn can hasten the group development within the team. Some college coaches promote team unity by creative means such as fundraisers or even car washes or providing opportunities for players in general to get to know one another better. These interactions can help establish the team's identity. When a group feels distinct, its feelings of unity and oneness increase, so distinctiveness is very important in helping to develop group and team dynamics. Distinctiveness is traditionally achieved within teams by providing such things as uniforms or special initiation rights or special privileges. Fairness is an important component of the team climate. Athletes must learn trust, because trust is at the core of their perceptions that they are being treated fairly. Athletes should believe that their play, effort, and contributions to the team are being evaluated objectively and evenly against others. Fairness influences commitment, motivation, and satisfaction among players. The final component is known as similarity, and similarity among team members in commitments, attitudes, aspirations, and goals is very important to developing a positive team climate. Factors such as socioeconomic background and playing experience are not necessarily important in building a team concept. The more group members are aware of similarities among each other, the greater probability they will show in being able to develop a stronger team concept.